Welcome to Vibrant Publishers podcast where we interview experts in various fields to share their insights and knowledge with our listeners. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Mr. Mark Kuchinski back for second episode on decision making. In this episode our focus will be on delving deeper into the concept of group mechanics. Mark is an advisory board member of our publishing house and he is the author of the book Decision Making Essentials by Vibrant Publishers. He is an assistant professor of accounting practice at Moravian College in Bethlehem, PA, where he teaches graduate level decision analysis class and several advanced accounting classes. He is a certified public accountant and holds a BA with high honors, an MBA from Rutgers University, and a doctorate from Drew University. Mark, welcome back to our podcast, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Nicole. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. Great. So today we'll be talking in depth about the chapter four of your book, which uh, talks about group mechanics. Could you give us an overview of this topic? Sure. Um, one of the great failures, I think, in the business world is the fact that groups often don't function as well as they should, and the fact they are often dysfunctional. So in general terms, we have to reconcile ourselves to the fact that the more important the decision is, the more likely it is going to be done in a group context. So if group decisions uh, are the norm for bigger decisions in the business world, understanding how groups work and come to a decision is a sort of an essential skill in the, the modern business world. So in chapter four, I talk about some of the common techniques that we that are used um, to facilitate group operations and also one of the major dysfunctions of you know, group operations, which is a group thing. Okay, got it. And uh, within group mechanics, we have group dynamics and group dysfunctions. Could you please elaborate on these two topics? Sure. Let's start with um, the dysfunctions first. I think one of the most important, the most well-known group dysfunction is that of a group think. And a short definition of group think is a situation where the group mem members value unanimity and harmony more than a seeking a better decision. Um, and so you have to be careful uh, about groupthink because certain groups are more prone to groupthink than others. So, for instance, if you have a cohesive group um, that's often insulated from outside influences, um, you can have a group that's been working together for a long time is also uh, more prone to groupthink. Uh, you have various um, situations where one or a few members of the group dominate the group, and they could dominate either because of hierarchical authority, knowledge, seniority, or for any number of uh, informal authority uh, situations. And oftentimes groups will pressure or people, members of the group, will perceive that there is pressure to conform to the group. Right. I, I also think it's important to understand that groups have a life of their own. And you cannot assume that the group dynamic will, will, will always be beneficial. You have to monitor that process and structure that process to make sure the group performs as well as it should. Okay, got it. And wh what do, do you think will combat groupthink? Um, I think there, there, there are several ways of combating groupthink. One is to make sure that you have a diverse group when you start. Um, diversity of opinion and diversity of members is a critical component to uh, making sure that a group functions as well as it should have. Um, you should attempt to engage outsiders. And by that, I mean have an opinion um, from 
not only outside of your particular group, but also perhaps outside of the organization itself. Um, to, to give you a good example, when a university hires a, a professor, the majority of the committee of, of the hiring group will be from that professor's particular department, but there always is a member from outside of the particular department to provide an outside opinion. At the end of the day, to provide sort of the university's uh, viewpoint of a, of a right. particular professor at the end of the day. Um, you want to make sure that you get unfiltered input, and there are ways of doing that by, by structuring the actual um, way information is shared. And I think more controversially, you always want to encourage conflict in a group. And by that I mean, you know, not personal conflict, but intellectual yeah. conflict and discussion to generate options, help generate options. Okay, so is it the only potential group dysfunction or are there any other group think uh, dysfunctions as well? Ah, um, excellent question. There are, group think is the most well-known of uh, group dysfunctions, but I think that there are many, many others. And, you know, for, for brevity purposes, I, let me just give you a couple that, that I find most intriguing. The first is what, has been labeled the spiral of silence, okay? And a spiral of science, silence is where members of a group will often be more forthcoming with their opinions if they believe other members of the group actually agree with their opinions. So you, people will often remain silent or not be completely forthcoming if they think that there is going to be opposition to, to their viewpoints. Um, you know, people tend to avoid conflict. And I think that this is, you know, just one way that, that people will avoid conflict. Uh, another is group shift and, and uh, group polarization. In, in, group, in group shift, um, sometimes the initial positions of members, uh, group members are, can be exaggerated. They, they're trying to make a point and they will exaggerate a particular point. Group polarization occurs when the final decision um, is often an extreme, extreme point of view. Um, you have something called pluralistic ignorance, where group members mistakenly believe that everyone else has a different opinion. Um, and they'll go along with a particular viewpoint because they believe that this is the, the opinion of the group. And I think a famous example of that was the uh, the Bay of Pigs catastrophe uh, when the United States planned an invasion of Fidel Castro's Cuba, where the group that was looking at it um, simply did not share their opinions that this could end in a particular disaster. You know, false consensus. You know, group members think that their own judgments sometimes are everyone else's judgment in the group or should be everyone else's judgment. In the group. And my favorite is the Abilene Paradox. Um, which I won't go through the entire story, but it talks about the Abilene Paradox occurs when a family in the Midwest United States decides that they're going to take a long drive to Abilene, Kansas for dinner. And everyone goes along with, with the idea, and they take a long, dusty drive to Abilene, Kansas, and it's hot, and they come back, and, and everyone really thought that it wasn't such a good idea, but no one wanted to speak up. And when they come back, they all realize, well, it was a long, dusty drive. The food wasn't that good. Why on earth did we ever agree to, to such a thing? And the paradox is no one spoke up at the end of the day. So you have many, many different types of dysfunctions that groups can, um, groups can in fact, encounter. So being aware of them... Uh, can help prevent those those dysfunctions. Right. And uh, what are some of the lessons, some key takeaways from this list? I think we don't simply name them just to put a name on them. Um, I think we go through that list and understand what a group dysfunction is so that we can spot it when it is occurring. As I mentioned previously, 
groups have a life of their own. Each group has a dynamic of its own. And depending on the members and composition and the process of the group, um, it could end in one of these dysfunctions. I think if we are aware of these potential dysfunctions, we can help either A, head them off, or B, not implement the decision of the group because um, it could be potentially disastrous or, or, or more mildly, perhaps a wrong decision at, at the end of the day. Got it. Got it. Thank you for sharing that. So is there any general remedy for these dysfunctions? Uh, I, yes. First is um, you, you want to make sure that you have a diverse group. Um, the diversity of a group will add, add more options for the group. I think a good example of that is um, recently, you know, in the Catholic Church, for instance, which is has one billion worldwide adherents, it has a hierarchy. Uh, they've tried to introduce women into the decision making process within the Vatican, um, which I think is is a healthy thing, just purely from a decision making um, perspective, because having diverse members will introduce. Um, multiple viewpoints that may not be expressed by sort of the celibate male priesthood, which is this, which previously the Vatican decision making was related to. You you want to have a structured process. Okay. That is, you want to make sure that information is shared, and there are various techniques for, for doing that along the way. You can't just assume that information will be shared because, for instance, you might end up with the Abilene paradox, or you know, or pseudo consensus of uh, some some thought. Um, you definitely you want to ensure that there is communication from the group and through through the group. You do that through your your uh, through a structured process, and you want to make sure that there is a way you can aggregate the consensus. The group whether that's by voting at the end, whether it's by polling, but you definitely want to make sure that the members of the group have an opportunity to express their viewpoints. Okay, regarding proper communication, could you uh, explain that in detail? Sure. Um, oftentimes, too early communication results in a group dysfunction. So for instance, if someone in authority of the group, whether again, it is a knowledge expert or it is the someone that has formal authority, um, will state their opinion too early on in the process, um, it could chill the further discussion of, of the group. Um, so, for instance, when I was a chief financial officer of some public companies and I would run a group meeting, I would be very careful not to state my opinion very early because some people would sort of fall in line with that particular opinion. Um, so you, okay. you, you definitely want to have open and clear communication, and you want to make sure all, all um, viewpoints are brought to bear. So you structure the group process in such a way that the flow of information is controlled, but not uh, impeded. You want all members of the group to, to, to be able to, to get their viewpoint across, but you want to do it in such a way that, that no one feels a particular pressure to, to go um, in a particular direction. One example, um, which I cover in the book, is what's known as the Delphi process, known, uh, you know, if those familiar with Greek history understand the oracle of Delphi, where people would go to get a reading from the, the priestesses there. Um, the modern Delphi process begins with an anonymous survey, generally, or questionnaire. So members of the group complete the questionnaire or survey and submit the questions 
the results are tallied, aggregated, and then shared with all of the other members of the group. The idea being, number one, if it's anonymous, um, you might not feel any pressure because you're anonymously giving your uh, opinion. And, and secondly, it is a structured way to make sure that everyone participates. Yeah. Right. So the material is tallied, summarized, and it's sent out to the members again. And there is another round that happens. Okay. Right. The same questions are asked. And now that everyone sees everyone else's perspective, they have an opportunity to change their mind, to, to uh, sharpen their focus, to add um, any additional information that they might. And this iterative process continues as long as there is discussion going on. So eventually what happens is either consensus will emerge or or there will be no change. We'll come to a point where, where members' points of view have solidified, and, and that is sort of the final document, final output of the group. But again, the key point is that there is a process where everyone can speak. There is a method for aggregating um, the consensus of the group, and no one is prohibited from, from speaking in that particular group, where they don't feel any pressure um, concerning their participation in the process. Okay, got it. Thank you for sharing that example. You also gave an example talking about diversity. So could you explain why diversity is so important in groups? Okay, I, there's a couple reasons. Um, when we speak about diversity in a group, we need different viewpoints. And diversity is important because it interjects new ideas into the group. If everyone has is coming from the same viewpoint, then in fact you're not introducing all of the potential options or you're limiting your, your options uh, for your decision. By having diversity, you are injecting new ideas into the group. More options um, often be, will be considered. And you know, and then secondly, even if these new options are rejected, an interesting phenomenon occurs, and that is the, the majority of the group, those holding the majority opinion in the group, will then begin to sharpen their focus. They'll sharpen their arguments because they either feel their viewpoint is being challenged or they feel that they have to, in fact, um, have an argument against what is being being proposed. So this tends to also result in better better decisions, better judgments uh, at the end of the day, more reasoned uh, decisions. Um, if you have to fortify your decision, if you're in the majority, you then spend more time on it. You vet all of you vet the option a little more carefully. You, in fact, may even reject the option that you originally came up with. You may rethink your position based on the new evidence that um, that comes forward. So, because this, because of the new ideas and the fact that there might be a minority um, point of view, the decision is much more robust. Um, at the end of the day. And one example, I think, is if you think of an appeals court where you have multiple judges reviewing a situation and there is a majority opinion and there is a minority opinion. You know, the judges in the majority write their opinion, the judges in the minority write their opinion, and they exchange drafts before it's issued. And the idea is that you might change someone's mind by sharing ideas. At the end, so at the end, you know, there's a, there is a majority opinion and there is a minority opinion that's understood. But in between, a lot of people lose sight of the fact that sometimes um, the minority opinion will sway someone in the majority or vice versa at the end of the day because they're, they're freely exchanging ideas. 
And I think that's critical not only to the administration uh, you know, of, drug, of justice, obviously, but I think from an organizational standpoint, it's absolutely critical where people can exchange ideas and, and look at all of the options. The minority opinion forces the majority to, fo- to sharpen its focus and, cons- and consider some factors that they probably could find to be inconvenient at the end of the day. Okay, but then in, in diversity, isn't there a chance of more conflict happening between two people or more than two people because of diverse ideas? Uh, th- absolutely. Uh, but going back to something that I had mentioned previously, you, I think when you are dealing in a group situation, you want to encourage conflict. Um, and not personal okay. conflict, but you want to structure the processes of the group in such a way that personal conflict is kept out of um, the situation. Right. And as an aside, one of my managers used to say, only amateurs take things personally uh, at, at the end right. of the day. And I've always believed that, that as long as there is a professional discussion occurring and you lose the discussion, you know, at the end of the day, you are, in fact, um, you've had an opportunity to be heard, which is critical to, to many people. And also, you know, decisions happen over a long period of time. There isn't, there isn't one moment when a decision is made. Decisions are typically a process over a period of time. Uh, it, right. Some, a, a lot of, a, a lot of behavioral scientists have called, have mentioned that you know it is a fallacy to think that everyone gets into a room and makes a decision at one time. Um, decisions happen over a period of time, and it's this idea of creative conflict that is critical to making a good decision. But if done properly, the process of the group will eliminate any personal conflict and make sure it, it's an intellectual or creative conflict that's being considered in the decision-making process. Okay, got it. Now, in Chapter 4, you also describe brainstorming. So could you give us additional details about how you would go about brainstorming? Sure. Um, the idea of brainstorming is to generate as many ideas as quickly as possible over a short period of time, generally at the beginning of the decision-making process, so that you have a list of possible options as well as a list of uh, potential sources of information that that you can use when making the decision. So there's two types of brainstorming. Um, So let me describe one, and and that is sort of the group brainstorming, where you want to gather people together into a room and start generating as many ideas as you can. Now, there's a couple rules for brainstorming. Number one, um, no idea is a bad idea while it's being put forward. What does that mean? You definitely do not want to evaluate ideas um, as they are being generated. Uh, If someone someone rolls their eyes, says that's a bad idea, what will happen? As we've seen, that person will, will shut down at that point. So you definitely do not want to evaluate the ideas as they are being produced. You want to have one scribe, someone that's keeping the list, right? You don't want everyone to keep the list because you want them to focus on the brainstorming at at the end of the day. Um, There has to be a sufficient period of time so that everyone can participate in the brainstorming. Say you had a five-minute brainstorm is probably certainly not sufficient at the end of the day. At the end of the brainstorming, you your goal should be to come out with an actionable list. And by actionable, I mean those ideas that you actively want to consider 
or those sources of information you actively want to consult or add to your list of potential sources of information. Um, the group can, at the end, can decide that some of the ideas may not particularly be worthwhile, but hopefully there are some gems that the group will actually want to consider uh, at that point as well. So brainstorming is a valuable, um, a valuable process. And in fact, I run a brainstorming session during my graduate seminar, um, and many people have found that it's really a, an interesting process. Some of them have not taken part in a brainstorming session before, and of course I insist on the proper brainstorming uh, methodology. They found it to be quite an interesting experience at the end of the day, and many times they come up with options that they would not personally consider. That's sort of a group brainstorming, and probably the most valuable type of brainstorming. But I don't want to diminish personal brainstorming as well. And what do I mean by personal brainstorming? Well, I've always advocated the idea of taking uh, a break from working on a particular problem or decision. But I mean, by that I mean, do a creativity enhancing exercise. Go for a walk, jog, swim, exercise. Then come back, allow yourself a sufficient period of time, and then make a list, again, of sources of information and possibilities. Um, in the old days, I would say you want to have a pad and, and a pen handy, but that would date myself. You know, now I would say have your laptop or your iPad handy so you can start making a list right. that you can that you can uh, sort of record for yourself. Um, but if you if you do that, you allow yourself a sufficient period of time, you know, twenty minutes to a half hour, where you're just focusing on a problem. You often be amazed at the number of ideas that you that you can generate. And and the idea is if if this problem or decision falls in your area of expertise, you may indeed be the company or organization expert on a particular problem. So uh, your insight is valuable and it is worth the time forcing yourself to sit down and, and do this. Um, let's face it, we're all busy. Um, we all, if Herbert Simon's view of bounded rationality and satisficing means that we only have a certain amount of time to work on a particular problem, but the personal brainstorming forces us to just take a step back and consider other options for the decision. And again, the more options you consider, generally the better off you are at the end of the day. Now. Again, you might generate, say, 10 ideas while you're doing a personal brainstorming. At the end, you say five are not worth may, not worth considering, but you might have some additional ideas you might then want to share with the group. So brainstorming on a personal level and a group level, definitely worth spending the time on Got it. as your approach to the decision. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, that brings us to the end of today's podcast episode on group mechanics and decision making. I hope you found our decision, a discussion insightful and gained a deeper understanding of how groups can influence the decision making process. Before we wrap up, I would like to extend a special thanks to Mr. Mark for joining us today. And we are grateful for your valuable insights. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. 